we are living in the last days. Uh, that, that concept strikes different people in different ways. For me, it strikes me with a tremendous uh, sense of excitement, the thought of seeing Jesus coming soon for his bride, uh, and then coming after that to establish his kingdom. And, and uh, as we've often prayed for when we say, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, it strikes me with a sense of fear and, and concern for all of those in the world who are not yet believers. Uh, and we'll have to go through that or into that period of time where God is bringing his wrath upon the world. Um, and some who, even while that's happening, will still resist him and never come to a saving faith. That saddens me. It breaks my heart. And so there's this tension that exists within me, and I think within a lot of believers, as we consider both the joy of seeing our Lord, the uh, the, the the great hope that we have of being in his presence and seeing him, uh, but yet also tempered with the fact that when those things begin to unfold, um, that is also going to mean a tremendous amount of destruction and pain and misery for those uh, who resist him and who reject him, and will have to therefore face so much of that. Um, but that said, uh, that that understanding of what is to come upon the world in terms of God's judgment should not diminish the excitement and the hope of seeing God bring about his purposes. Because remember, the pain and suffering in this world that is going on right now is something we want to see end. Uh, to, to, to ask God to hold off his, his interacting in the world on the, on, in one sense is also to ask for the prolonging of this current world condition. It's, these are hard things to consider and to think through and to mull over, but, um, but in no way should we ever uh, see Christ's coming as something that we don't want to happen. Uh, uh, matter of fact, even a, a, like, a, like a bride for her bridegroom longs to see him arrive so that he can sweep her away and, and, and such. You know, what, what bride would ever tell her bridegroom, no, take your time. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's too much going on right now and all that kind of thing. No, where's, where's the excitement and the anticipation in that? Um, yes, it means some things will be affected, but it also means the fulfillment of all of that which God has promised. And I want to see that so desperately. And I think as we look around the world, uh, as, as we've taken time to do periodically in our prophecy briefs, uh, if we look at the elements uh, going on, uh, coming together in the world, much like a chess game where the pieces are moving around the board, moving uh, ultimately toward checkmate, as we see what's happening, we can't help but realize that we are on the cusp. Uh, just think about the, the move toward globalism just in itself. The scripture speaks so much about a millennial kingdom, not in a vacuum, but in contradistinction to the kingdoms of this world that have been seeking to establish primacy, um, but yet one after another topple each other until one day the kingdom finally comes. Daniel, we read about this in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter um, uh, 4. And so we see these things coming about, uh, happening, coalescing around us in some ways, uh, in, in the globalist mindset, that is, uh, the idea of bringing together the nations of the world into one final global uh, kingdom. Uh, however, that kingdom is not going to have God at the heart of it. It's going to have a man who will stand up and claim to be God, uh, a counterfeit Christ, Antichrist. But it's not the kingdom that this world ultimately needs, even though it is the kingdom this world so desperately wants. But the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ one day will consume all of those kingdoms and they will become his. Um, when we think about things like the Great Reset and the various pillars that establish it, again, uh, uh, government, economics, environment, technology, social, things like this that, that um, are very directly and, and distinctly being addressed uh, by this global forum to try and bring about a massive reset of how we do everything in the world. Uh, an economy that ultimately becomes socialized, where it, it becomes something where a, a global government begins to just take care of the people of this world, but personal ownership of things and, and those kinds of things go away and we'll have nothing and be happy with that and that sort of, uh, those sorts of, of, of um, you know, slogans and such. Um, but along with that kingdom comes a lot of things that, um, while on the one hand sound, uh, sound uh, good, ish, but it brings with it a lot of things that really aren't. Again, the most important of which is that the ruler of that kingdom is not going to be the Lord. And so therefore he's going to, as we see in Paul's writings and uh, 
Uh, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we see that he establishes himself and, and demands to be worshipped above all that is called God. Well, that's not because he is God. It's because he demands to be worshipped as though he were. Very reminiscent of Satan's own uh, desire to be like the Most High. And that uh, ultimately reaches its apex in the, in the person of Antichrist, where Satan gets that worship vicariously through the Antichrist. And then after the second coming, after the millennial kingdom, when Satan is released again, uh, Revelation chapter 20, where he for a short time will be released and he will seek to bring the world together behind him, ultimately in a final rebellion against the Lord. That is what this kingdom of the world is ultimately headed toward. Uh, and we know this is true because the scriptures tell us it's true. And so there's no reason to doubt that this is going to happen as foretold, as, as given to us in advance, that we might be warned about it, but that as we also see these elements coming together, it might stir within us an understanding of how close we ultimately are. And frankly, believers throughout uh, all of history, uh, not all believers, frankly, but but early believers, by and large, and then throughout history, at least some believers, uh, some, some group of believers throughout history have always kind of lived with this sense of watching and waiting, uh, as the scriptures encourage us to, to look forward to that which the scriptures describe, leading up to Christ's coming to establish his kingdom. And even prior to that, to bring his bride away, that we might ultimately return with him when he establishes that kingdom. Um, however, sadly, there has been a departure through the years uh, from so many of these rich biblical uh, uh, elements of the historic Christian faith. Um, many mainline churches and many that fall under the umbrella of Orthodox churches and that um, have long since, uh, since the times of Origen and, and Augustine and their capacity to spiritualize what the Word of God is saying, have departed from any uh, literal reading of so many of these passages, and therefore they have a very different pro prophetic outlook on it. Uh, and, and this is certainly not true of all of those in those mainline churches or Orthodox churches, but by and large, those bodies of believers have kind of set apart any, anything looking like an imminent return of Christ uh, and, and, and have instead sort of established themselves in this world and just continued to press on until one day it finally happens, but there is a certain element of that expectancy that is just completely absent. Uh, and that is, that's not a biblical perspective. The scriptures encourage us to have the exact opposite mindset of one that would say, my master delays his coming. Uh, the idea of, of thinking that Jesus could not return today is not something you find in scripture. That is a non-biblical idea. The, the, the scriptures encourage us to have our eyes up looking forward to the coming of Christ at any time. The imminency is something that is a truly biblical idea. Um, many in the modern day church, even outside of the main line, and, 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 and again, the orthodox, I don't mean orthodoxy, but I mean churches that label themselves as orthodox, Greek orthodox, uh, and those kinds of things. Um, but churches even outside of that have become sort of rife with resistance to the idea of Jesus soon coming or imminent coming. Uh, for any number of reasons, some because they, for some reason, believe that waiting for him to come and enjoying this life is somehow better than his being with us. Uh, again, what kind of a bride doesn't want her bridegroom to come? You know, that's uh, there's there's a question about whether you're actually getting hitched, you know, and that kind of thing. If there's really no excitement about that, um, but no, we should be very excited about this. Uh, it, it astounds me that there are those in the church today that that don't really want to see him coming soon. There should be an expectancy and even a longing to see him. Uh, again, in my own heart, this is an ever-growing thing. Uh, I find, uh, and, and I know this is true for many of you as well, as I read the scriptures, and not just prophetic things, but as I read the scriptures to get to know him, not just what he does, but who he is, um, I find myself growing in my desire to worship. I find myself wanting to draw closer to him, longing to meet him finally face to face and not just by faith, but in person. Um, I, I, I long to hear him say, well done. I, I long to hear, enter into the joy of your Lord. I long to gather with the, uh, the angels and the multitude from every tongue, tribe, and nation that are worshiping around the throne. Uh, I, I, I can't wait for that moment. And that desire is growing like it never has before within me. Um, I remember being very excited about seeing Jesus as a young believer. I remember being very excited about learning new things about the Lord and everything. 
But now that I've been walking with the Lord for about 30 years, I'm, I'm realizing it, it's, it, there, it's, it's, that, that excitement and that desire has only deepened and grown to where it's, I just want to see the fulfillment of that relationship that I've been called to enter into, uh, ultimately reach its crescendo and its apex. I so desperately want to see him. And that causes me not to want to be connected to this world and to be less and less connected to this world every day. Um, you know, I grew up in a particular, uh, well, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. And, you know, historically throughout the ages, the Roman Catholic Church has had very firm roots in this world, politically and all of that kind of a thing. Uh, and frankly, the, the leadership of that church throughout the centuries has, has, has sought to, to have prominence and prestige and position in this world. And frankly, they've probably already received their reward in that regard. Um, and, and I remember um, just never having any sense and again, that's not true of all uh, Catholics by any means. I'm not trying to pick on one particular group. It's just been was my experience. Um, but you know, for the most part, there was never a sense of seeing him. It was like someday I'll die and and I'll you know hopefully go to heaven and and all that kind of thing. But there was never this sense that no, he's coming. Like Paul talks about him snatching the bride away. Jesus is going to come to get us. And then later he'll come back and establish his kingdom. Like he's coming to bring us home for a marriage supper. Uh, that, and, and that was just absent from my faith until I ultimately was born again. And I came to understand what the scriptures were saying about these things. Um, and, and my ever-growing desire to see these things fulfilled causes me to pull away ever more from this world. You know, another group, by the way, just to be fair, not to just pick on one group, but think of like the kingdom now theology or the New Apostolic Reformation that is so intimately uh, connected with it. The idea that Jesus can't come back until we establish his kingdom for him to come back and rule over. Um, not only is that absurd, it's patently unbiblical. Uh, again, I mentioned Daniel a little while ago. Um, you know, Daniel speaks about the idea of, of all of these kingdoms, uh, this statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, and that Daniel interprets uh, each of these elements of these metals and ultimately this iron mixed with clay in the, in the toes and the feet. Um, these represent kingdoms that ultimately are struck and taken down by a kingdom, uh, uh, this rock, this mountain not cut with hands, not made by human hands, that ultimately comes and is established as a kingdom that will last forever. And it has nothing to do with man establishing it. It's completely contrary to that. Uh, and so the theology that we somehow set up Jesus' kingdom for him to return to is a patently unbiblical idea. We should not be, and, and, and part of the problem with that view is that it causes us to think that Jesus can't come back until we get things in a certain order for him. No, he could come today. There's, there's nothing biblical that says he could not return to snatch us away at this moment. Um, and so there is a deep desire. Uh, you know, one other thing I'll mention too before I, I want to, ultimately we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse 7 uh, through 19 in just a moment. But one other thing I'll mention too as we kind of move into that is that sadly, the perspective I'm talking about has often been uh, equated with an idea of escapism, which frankly, I don't mind one bit. Um, but the implications of it are what I would take exception to. And here's what basically the thought is. All of you people who think that Jesus is coming to snatch away his bride in some kind of a rapture or specifically in a pre-tribulational rapture are just trying to escape. You think that you should not have the hardships and difficulties that other Christians have experienced throughout all of history and even today experience in, in many circumstances around the world. To that I say no, a thousand times no. I don't, uh, on the one hand, I don't feel the kind of uh, inner sense that I need to stick my spiritual chest out, just take whatever's coming because somehow I need to prove something uh, or that somehow, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't even know all the various elements of what people think when they think that. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think for a second that I should be exempted from any of that uh, because Christians have always been persecuted by the world. But the rapture is not a response to persecution by the world. It's an escape from the wrath of God that he is going to bring upon the world, a wrath that Jesus took for us. And so therefore, the rapture is not just uh, some escapist hope. It is a necessary element of God's ultimate fulfilling of his, of his uh, prophetic and eschatological purposes. He has got to remove those whom he has saved from wrath before he brings his wrath. It's just that simple. 
And it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. The Bible doesn't make it more complicated than that. It is a very simple and straightforward thing. I don't deserve to be raptured away. I don't deserve to escape uh, God's wrath, nor do I deserve to escape persecution. But persecution is something that the world brings upon us and will continue to bring upon us. As Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, in this world. Uh, But ultimately, he has overcome the world. Well, one of the elements of that overcoming is that he has paid for the sin that I was guilty of. And so therefore, since there is therefore no longer any sacrifice for sin, I can't be here. And you as a believer can't be here when God brings his wrath upon the world because Jesus took that for us. So therefore, we must be gone. So, you know, is it an escapist thing? Sure, I guess. But what kind of a sadist wants to stay here and get God's wrath. Well, are you crazy? I, I don't understand your thinking on that. That's, that's insane to me. Uh, not only is it unbiblical, I just think it's crazy. But, um, you know, so for us to, uh, you know, and, and here's the implication I guess I wanted to get to before we move into the passage. The implication is that if you are looking for the imminent return of Christ, if you think Jesus could come back and snatch us away today, then that will somehow build in us a mindset where we don't need to invest ourselves in kingdom work until he does. I've heard good, solid teachers who I really like say this, um, and make, make a real case of it. Uh, and I hear it echoed in some of the comments that sometimes come uh, when we talk about this subject. Um, the idea that if, if Jesus is coming today, then what's the point of getting involved in gospel ministry because I'm, I'm just waiting for him to come now and all this kind of a thing. That, that is not a necessary element of living in expectancy. For example, uh, and I'm not alone, I can only use myself as an example, but clearly anyone watching can think of people with the same mindset. Uh, my desire for Jesus to come today and my expectancy and longing for him to do so doesn't cause me to want to sit back and just wait like up in like some cult up waiting, you know, for, uh, you know, as so many times it's happened in history. Uh, where Jesus is coming on a comet, so let's just go wait over here, you know, and not do anything. No, I, it, it causes me to want to do this. It causes me to want to tell people. It causes me to want to teach the word so that we can have a people prepared to meet him and to know him well when he comes. Uh, it causes me to want to share my faith. It causes me to want to be about his business when he returns, as the Bible seems to imply we should be doing as we live in expectancy. Uh, That's sort of a post hoc ergo propter hoc, the idea that because of this, therefore that. Because we believe Jesus is coming today, therefore I'm not going to worry about doing anything for him because it might be today. That is a false, slippery slope, indefensible perspective, and it depends completely on the subjective nature of people's own personalities. That is not a necessary uh, outworking of living in expectancy. Uh, Does my expectancy for Jesus cause me to uh, want to sidestep anything that might bring a measure of persecution? There might be some people that that does that too, but not me, and shouldn't you either. Living in expectancy and living our daily lives under whatever circumstances we find ourselves under should not have to be in conflict with one another. We should be living full on for Jesus with the knowledge that we might see him today, and after all, don't you want to be doing uh, his work when he comes? Yes, I do, absolutely. So that being said, let me, uh, you know, Peter addresses this. And this is uh, where I wanted to probably should have gotten to a long time ago. But here is 1 Peter chapter 7. I'm going to read through verse 19 and just share a few thoughts on it. And I'll leave the passage to you to read and reread and consider what Peter is saying here. But let me talk to a few points here. Verse 7 begins with these words. The end of all things is near. Now, Peter believed that the end was coming. Okay, The end of all things. Okay, Not just you know persecutions coming or something like that. The end of all things is coming. Peter was living with the belief that things were going to wrap up soon. The end of all things is near. Therefore, notice what he says. Therefore, since that's true, he had no doubt about it. Since that's true, here's how we should be in response to that. Here's what we should be thinking and doing since we believe this is true. Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it, or minister with it, in serving one another as good stewards, 
or those who are responsible and been given something to steward uh, of the manifold grace of God. That is the thing we were given to steward or be stewards of. Whoever speaks is to speak, as it were, the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with God, which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also, uh, so uh, that also at the revelation of His glory you may receive uh, rejoice. I should say with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? The Bible says whom the Lord loves, he chastens, right? And so God brings that into his people, ultimately to purify us, to prepare us to ultimately see him. That is not the same thing as wrath, okay? Uh, When our parents correct us in that, it is for our good. It's so that we can learn something in order to ultimately become more mature, more responsible. God's wrath is not about teaching people things. God's wrath is about bringing ultimate judgment. And so therefore, this is not referring to us going through God's judgment on the earth, but rather, prior to that, he is bringing us through things that are preparing us ultimately for it. Uh, For to see him, I should say, so that when his judgment comes, and we're out of here by that point, we're seeing him, we're knowing him, we're dwelling with him, but this is not the wrath of God coming upon his people. Um, Verse 18, and... If uh, it is uh, with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Again, at the very beginning, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, and he goes on to explain the mindset, uh, the behavior, all of the things that believers should be living like, sober-minded, sober-spirited, the idea of being sober or uh, clear-headed, um, self-controlled, things like this. As a matter of fact, the word dispassionate is even part of the definition of the idea of sober. Um, dispassionate meaning that we are able to sort of separate ourselves in some sense from what's happening here so that we might get a better view of it, a more objective view of what's happening. Um, not that we don't care about the world around us, but we recognize we're separate from it and therefore we see it differently. Um, When it comes to our understanding about what God is doing in the world and the fact that it's a fallen world in which he is working right now, we understand that hardships, persecutions, difficulties will come upon believers. That's just part of what it means. Paul said to Timothy that all who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's a promise. And it's not one generally claimed by name and claim it uh, preachers and that kind of thing, but it is a biblical promise. If you are seeking to live godly, in Christ Jesus, then you can expect to be living your life with a target on your back. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be sought after for the sake of harm. You're going to be spoken ill against and those kinds of things. That's what happens to believers. And it always has, and it always will up until the millennium, essentially, and then into eternity. But ultimately, you and I are going to face hardship, persecution, difficulty, know it, understand it, own it. And because we see the world differently than a non-believer does, we recognize that even as Peter says at the end here, those who suffer according to the will of God, okay? In other words, it is God's will that we do experience the things that we experience. Why? So that we'll grow, so that we'll be strengthened, so that we'll learn to trust him in ways that we might not otherwise learn. Uh, All of the various manifold reasons that we probably couldn't begin to uh, enumerate ultimately, that God can use those things in our lives. And so we are to find a way to live within the tension of the now and the not yet, to recognize that while we wait expectantly and longingly for him, we also find ourselves living in, in a circumstance that will bring with it difficulties and hardships, sometimes even hard to understand. But nonetheless, we have entrusted ourselves to a faithful creator, and so therefore we look, we wait, we watch. Uh, Peter would also write elsewhere in his, his epistles that Um, that there are those who say, well, where is the promise of his coming? You know, and they mock and they think it's silly that we'd be looking for Jesus to return and that kind of thing. 
Peter speaks against that. Peter, who knew the Lord as well as anybody who ever walked on the face of the earth, he said, no, that's a completely wrong idea. We know, just as things have come to pass, uh, as, as God said they would in the past, we can know with assurance that this will happen as well. And so we live with hope. We live in a world that we're uncomfortable with. Uh, we, we weren't really made for this world, ultimately. We we're made for the next. But here we live, and here we are for the time being. But that time is going to end soon. And we should be living as though it's going to end soon, because at the end of that, we see him. When the day comes, uh, I believe it's when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I believe it's when God is ready to snatch the bride away. And ultimately, Jesus you know, comes to snatch us away, and that he begins to again work through Israel in these final days uh, uh, that we read about so much in the book of Revelation, that these things are all coming upon us. That should affect us. That should impact us. If you're not ready for that, then you need to get ready for that. If you are ready for that, then live in the expectant, longing, daily hope that you will see him face to face. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace toward us. We thank you, Lord, that you are, that you have laid out a plan for how the ages will ultimately go and come to an end and how one day Jesus will come and set up that glorious millennial kingdom and that as believers will be part of that that we'll get to rule and reign with him, we'll get to see him in his glory, we'll get to uh, experience all that that will bring with it. And Father, let those thoughts, that knowledge of those truths, affect us in the way that we live today. Help us not to let any day uh, be a day that escapes without us thinking about the idea of seeing you and even recognize that it could be on this day. We thank you for the promises that you've made us. Undeserved, as they are. But nonetheless, in your goodness, in your grace, in your faithfulness, you've given us much to hang our hopes on. And so help us not to waver and to wane, but to just further dive deeper in, to invest ourselves all the more fully, and to separate ourselves all the more from the world as a result, as we look forward to Jesus coming. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Father, we pray that as we grow closer in time, uh, that, Lord, we will grow closer in relationship that we would spend time in your word, not just reading the prophecy parts. Those are important to us. We want to build our understanding of our great hope. But help us to read about all the word, that, read all the word that we might know about you personally, that we might get to know you all the, all the better. So that when we see you face to face, you'll be less and less of a stranger. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. And we bless you. And we ask you to build within us an ever-burning fire of hope that one day, maybe today, We'll see you. Thank you, Father. We ask you all these things, and we bless your great and glorious name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I always uh, invite you to feel free to share comments and thoughts and uh, things like that on our YouTube channel. Um, you can uh, also uh, go to my personal website at parsonspad.com where you can watch these videos. And you can also um, email me from there as well at brian at parsonspad.com. Go to our church's website at calvarychapelfranklin.com where you can watch our Sunday morning videos live streamed. Uh, you can also watch previous Sunday morning videos. You can also learn about our church, obviously, if you'd like to come out and visit us and, and such. We'd love to grow alongside of you and, uh, and, uh, and uh, again, expectantly look for the Lord together. So, But uh, thanks for watching, as always. I really appreciate uh, that we can spend this time in the Word together. And we just pray that, uh, my prayer is that we would just always grow more and more encouraged as we grow deeper and deeper in our relationship with him. So um, God bless you, and we will catch up with you next time.